We are really glad to have you, and let me, um, let me just kind of welcome you if you're a first-time guest with us. My name's Nate, and really, it's a joy. I say this every week, but I really do mean it's a joy and an honor uh, to be one of the pastors here, and today's a little bit different of a Sunday, so if you're a first-time guest with us, welcome, or maybe you're watching online for the very first time, or maybe you're somewhere in your first five tries. This is why we do something really unique called Five Tries. We think it's going to take about five visits, five tries is what we would call it. You coming back, really getting the fullness of who we are as a church, because today is, um, we're kind of calling it Vision Sunday. And I'm going to be sharing a lot of um, really exciting things. Matter of fact, two big key initiatives that we're going to be going after as a church in 2020. I'm going to share those here in a few minutes with you. Um, and so today I'm really excited just to share what I believe the Lord's continuing to push and to guide us towards. So um, if you've got a Bible, will you grab it? We're going to just get right into this. Matthew 28 today. Matthew 28, that's where the series is really rooted and birthed out of. Um, if you don't have a Bible, no worries. We'll put it on the screen here. But we're starting this series today called Make It Impossible. And it's really not a series as much as it is a banner. It's a, it's a core belief of our church that we want to make it impossible. Notice the tagline, for people to not know Jesus. I love this, that our highest aim as a church, although we have other aims, but our highest goal, although we have other goals, is without a doubt, don't ever lose sight of the fact that we want to be a church. We want to be a people that are known to making it impossible for people to not know Jesus. And what I love about this is that this was... This was Jesus' last commission to his disciples before he ascended up into heaven. And there's just something about what somebody says last that seems to matter the most, right? Like imagine moms and dads, and I don't mean to go Hallmark sentimental and Christmas season here with you, but imagine that you have like one final opportunity to say something to your child, and then you're going to physically leave, and they're never going to see you again. I would be willing to guess that you would reduce it down to what matters the most to you right before you leave to make sure your kids could walk away with this one thing. That's what Jesus is doing here. It's Matthew 28. He's been walking with these uh, 12 individuals for, well, three years now. He's died on the cross. He's resurrected from the grave. He's getting ready to ascend into heaven. And he says one final thing. So let's lean in today. Matthew 28, verse 16. Jesus says this, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. By the way, I just love the fact that even people who were in the presence of Jesus still doubted him. Like that should give you permission today that if you have questions and you have doubts that we really mean this, that you can belong with us before you believe like us. I think bring your doubting here. I think God's going to reveal himself to you. And, and so here's what it says in verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And then it says this right here, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And here's the promise. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I think if we're going to be a church that continues to make it impossible for people to not know Jesus, then I want to speak to you. I think we've got to understand this as Jesus followers today, uh, this concept that's called the irreducible minimum. That's what I want to title today. If you take notes, if you, if you like to lean in a little bit, I encourage you to do that. I'm going to speak to you on the subject, the irreducible minimum. Now, what the irreducible minimum is, this is an amazing concept. It, it is basically the understanding of what matters most. So the irreducible minimum answers the question, what is most important in this area of your life? Now, when I was thinking about this um, irreducible minimum, I was thinking about uh, Christmas. And uh, I don't know about you, but has anybody noticed, it just seems like we're celebrating Christmas earlier and earlier every year, okay? Did you like see the Christmas stuff go up before Halloween? I mean, the, like give the pilgrims their holiday, all right? Like nobody even honors Thanksgiving anymore, which is like one of my favorite holidays and it's just all Christmas automatically. Now, just a moment of honesty and yes, we're gonna cast eyes of judgment on you, but how many have already decorated your house for Christmas? Anybody bold enough? A tree, uh-huh. Yeah, what is wrong with us? I mean, it's like, 24-hour Hallmark movies have already started. You've got Michael Bublé on your playlist, and I don't know. But Christmas time. So here's what my family does every year. Um, every year, we, we, uh, we load up the car after Christmas at Life Point. so Christmas Eve this year. Y'all, we're doing five Christmas services, so just get ready for it. We're going to give you more details. But every year after Christmas at Life Point is done, we pack up the car, and we drive uh, to the Midwest, 
and we either go to Ohio or we go to Illinois. We see my family, Emily's grandparents, which is always kind of a risky thing because um, the weather in the Midwest, anybody from the Midwest, anybody from that area? Yeah, you got out too. Praise God. I know. We survived. We made it. We made it. So you know what I'm talking about. Like the weather's unpredictable. It could be snow. It could be ice. It could be, um, you know, rain. The one thing you're not going to get is the sun. That's just the only guarantee you're not going to get in the wintertime. So this particular year, this was, a, this was a while back. My son, Shaw, we only had him at the time. He might have been two years old. We're coming back from Illinois, heading to the Carolinas after a great holiday um, time with our family. And we got a late start in the day, and we're kind of coming um, into the southern part of Kentucky, getting ready to go into the Tennessee mountains. And it's getting dark outside when all of a sudden it starts to snow. Now, again, I've been in the South now for 13 years, longer since I've, I've been in college, but living down here for 13 years. When you look out the window as a Southerner now and you see snow, you kind of get excited, don't you? You get a little giddy. You're like, oh, look at that white stuff falling from the sky. It's so, it's so pretty. But then you're driving, and all of a sudden you realize that um, you can't see the grass anymore because the grass is now covered with the pretty white stuff. And then like an hour goes by and the snow's picking up and no longer can I see the road anymore. And then I begin to realize later in the fact, what, did you know that what constitutes a blizzard is actually not the amount of snow that's following, but it's the gust of the wind? That wind is the determining factor of whether or not a snowstorm is called a blizzard. And here I am, 9.30 at night with my family, my one-year-old, my wife in the car driving back from Ohio to the Carolinas and we find ourselves, this is true, in a full-blown blizzard. And we are fastly approaching the hills of Tennessee. And so in this moment, like, has this ever happened to you? Like, as the man in the car, and maybe I'm speaking to the guys, and I know, like, I got my family, and I got to protect them, but I'm, like, I'm freaking out in my head. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what are we going to do? And this is really the scenario. What are we going to do if we get stuck? Because there's nobody on the road at this point, And there's no exits that I could see. What are we going to do when we get stuck? And you really start to think about this concept, the irreducible minimum. What in that moment matters the most? I'll tell you what, it doesn't matter. XM radio, doesn't matter. Cool feature, doesn't really matter in that moment. That's not the irreducible minimum. It's not even food. We had goldfish in the diaper bag. <laughs> it's not water. You can go like three days without water. You know what? It's not indoor facilities to use the restroom. You can get really creative with a Gatorade bottle. That's, you feel me? Okay, like that's, that's not the irreducible minimum. You, know, you, you want to know in that moment what, the, what, my, what was going through my mind? The irreducible minimum was this right here. We just got to stay alive. Like survival. I got to keep my family alive. We got to make it through this blizzard if we get stuck on this highway. This is what matters the most. The, the Christmas presents in the back didn't matter. The great trip that we just had. The fact that we were going home to the Carolinas. The make and model of our car. None of that mattered. In this moment, when you understand how fragile life is, it was all about, we gotta stay alive. Now, of course, we got out of it. If you're wondering and concerned, did you make it? <laughs> we made it, we made it. We, like two miles down the road, there was an exit we pulled off and we got ourselves a hotel. But here's why I say that. I think the irreducible minimum is so critical for your life. Think about this. If you could, if you could determine what the irreducible minimum is for your marriage, for your business, for your parenting, for your relationships, it will, it will give you purpose because clarity gives purpose. What is it, if I strip everything away, what is it that absolutely matters the most? Now, here's why I say this. When I think about how fragile our city is, and I love our city. You know, the greater Charlotte area has over 1.5 million people that live in the greater Charlotte area. And we live in an amazing city, don't we? Do you know that Charlotte has a nickname? Like Chicago's the Windy City. Uh, New York's the Big Apple. Uh, Charlotte is Charlotte has a lot, which I was not on the naming committee for that, by the way, um, but it really lives up to its title. We do, we have a lot. Think about it. we got NASCAR, NASCAR Hall of Fame, shout out to NASCAR. Nobody in this service, all right, that's, we got a few of you, come on, there we go. We got an NFL team in the Panthers who are gonna beat Green Bay today, just prophesying. We, <laughs> that was for you. We, uh, we, we, we have an NBA team, I think. They're called the Hornets. Not really sure what they put out on the court, but we've got great restaurants, great shopping. The, the mountains are two hours away. The beach is three hours away. The weather is incredible. I mean, we have, we have an amazing city, don't we? And then if you zoom in even closer, let's get into our county, York County, if you're from uh, the York County area. Do you know York County, it is, it is the fastest growing county in the state of South Carolina. 
It is one of the most attractive places to live in the country. We have the top one or two school districts every year. We were in the top one or two school districts out of the entire state. I mean, it's an amazing place to live, to grow, and to, to raise a family. But you know what you could do? You could strip away all that. And you could take away everything that I just mentioned, and our city and our county would still be amazing. You want to know why? Because what makes this area so great is this right here, the people. That's what makes our area great. It's you, it's me, it's those of us that, that, are, that have moved here, that it's the people that make this city great. Listen, I love P.F. Chang's. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now. I mean, the lettuce wraps, Mongolian beef, the Kung Pao chicken has changed my life. I love it. I love that we got the performing arts community moves through, and you can see Broadways, and, and you can go to amazing music shows, and the art scene is great. I, I love the fact that they built the outlet mall on our side of the city. They, thank you. Jesus, I love the fact that we got a Starbucks on literally every corner. Wherever you look, there's a Starbucks. I love all of that. But I'm telling you right now, if you can strip all that away, and our city would still be great because it's people. And see, here's what I, here's what I know. This is honestly, church, this is what keeps me up at night if you ever wonder. What, this is what makes me do what I do. When I think about how fragile our city is, you want to know what the irreducible minimum is for all of humanity? It's simple. The irreducible minimum for all of humanity is this right here. People need Jesus. That's it, yeah. We can clap for that. We need to celebrate that, that people need Jesus. They don't need medicine. It's not education. It's not income. It's not relationships. All of those things are great. All of those things have their place, but every single one of those are temporary. For what I believe is the irreducible minimum is eternal, that, that eternity is on the line. Heaven is real. Hell is real. I know it's not popular to talk about in our 2000 and almost 20 church, hell is real. And what we do on this side of our life with this breath sets the fate for all of eternity. And when I look at the, the people that are moving to this area, people are broken, people are hurting, people are looking for real answers and real substance more than what a football game can take them to. And we have the answer. And they don't know this, but they desperately need a church that will continue to make it their banner to make it impossible for people to not know Jesus. I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of people counting on us to make sure that we keep the main thing the main thing. This is what Jesus was referring to in Matthew 28. I mean, you think about all the things he could have told his disciples right before he ascended, maybe one final lesson, maybe one final parable, maybe something on, I don't know, stewardship, but no, no, no. He says, guys, as I leave you, make it impossible. Go, make it impossible for people to not know me. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I've commanded. And I love how um, Luke writes it in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It's the same experience, just from a different advantage point. Here's what Luke says, Acts 1, 8, same moment. Luke says this, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness. Everyone shout witness. You'll be my witness, notice, in Jerusalem. In all of Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Notice where, where he says, again, nothing that Jesus said was out of order or unintentional. He said, start here in Jerusalem. You know why that's so important? Because that's where they were. In other words, can I tell you like this, church, if, we're, if you're going to be somebody that embodies this message of full life and grace, he's seriously saying, be my witness where you are. Notice this right here. Be my witness where you are. That, that wherever you are, that's where I want you to be my witness. And notice, Jesus doesn't say to witness. He says, be my witness. Now, I know that's a little bit of a nuance, but it's so important. One just tells people about God. The other lives the life of Jesus. One simply is, is looking for moments just to speak, but the other is actually living out the full life, living in grace, living in purpose, living life differently. And I'm telling you, when you live differently, and you love differently, and you handle your money differently, and you talk to your spouse differently, and you raise your kids differently, and you use your time differently. The natural byproduct of living differently is people are going to lean in who don't know God and go, what's going on with you? I'm not saying I'm going to believe it, but you got something, you got something different. He doesn't tell us to go witness. He says, be my witness. And I love this word witness because um, it literally means that we are a representative of Christ. Did you know that? Paul would say that you are an ambassador of Jesus. Think about this. An ambassador represents the king or the queen of a country. I know you maybe didn't realize this when you signed up for salvation and you got baptized, but that moment, man, you became literally an ambassador, a representative of Jesus. I tell my kids this all the time, my two older ones. Um, I take them to school every morning and right before they get out of the car. I don't do a lot of things right as a parent, but I, I do this. Um, I pray with them, and, and, and right before they leave, I say, guys, 
You guys are Siemens, so you need to respect, you need to be kind, and you need to look for those in need. That's what we do. We're respectful, we're kind, and we look for those in need. What are we gonna do today, guys? We're gonna be respectful, we're gonna be kind, and we're gonna look for those in need. Why? Because you don't just represent you, you represent the family. Are you with me? This isn't just your name, this is mom, this is our, you represent something bigger. That's what Jesus is saying. You don't just represent you, you represent me to the world. I want you to be my witness. And I just think that this is so important because I think the church on the subject of evangelism has kind of gotten it, has kind of gotten it backwards, I think, in a lot of ways. Like, like we, we want to go on mission trips, which is great, and we're going to do that, and we're going to go back to Honduras, and we got Ecuador coming up, and we're going to give you those opportunities. But what Jesus is trying to get to see is you don't need, you need to go on a mission trip. You are a mission trip. Like, you realize that we live in a post-church, post-Christian era. And, 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 like, if you're not willing to walk across your street to share your faith and develop a relationship, what makes you think that you're ready to fly across the seas? Okay, I'm getting somewhere right here. I can tell by how quiet it is. You, you, like, we always want to go somewhere. But Jesus says, no, no, no. Just start right here, Jerusalem. Where, where's that? That's right here. Be my witness where you are. Make it impossible for people to not know me. And I love that about our church and our 15 year, short 15 year story. That's always been our number one focus. And yes, discipleship matters. And yes, that's a key part. And yes, we do the growth track. But man, we, want, we don't ever wanna lose sight of this. So we wanna make it impossible for people to not know Christ. We always wanna make room for one more. We wanna go whatever we can do to reach one more. Because that one more might be your son. It might be your daughter. It might be your husband. It might be your neighbor. And that's what I love about the heartbeat of those of you that have been coming to Life Point. You know that three years ago, um, that's why so many families, I think over 200 families, did you know gave financially over and above their regular giving? Now, this is just crazy talk now. They give regularly with their tithes, and then they gave over that to help fund uh, us to be able to buy this land which is just under 12 acres, and build this building that you're now sitting in that we get to enjoy every single weekend, all because not a few wealthy people, but literally hundreds of people stepped in and said, I wanna make it impossible for people to not know Jesus, and we gave. And since we've been in this building, it's only been 20 months, uh, January coming up will be our second year anniversary. Y'all, it's been crazy. It's, it's been bananas. I mean, it really has. Um, I don't share uh, stats and attendance a lot because I don't think uh, butts and seats is what's most important, but you should know. Like we, when we started in, in this uh, two, 20 months ago, we were running about 700 people as a church. And now by God's grace, we hit over 1,200, 1,300 people every single weekend. That's like 85% growth. And many of them are coming on the arms of you and you're inviting neighbors and coworkers and friends and, and it's been great. And that's translated into life change. Do you realize we've seen 137 people say yes to Jesus in 20 months? I'm just gonna let you celebrate that right here for 137 eternities altered for Christ. 164 people have been baptized. We got another baptism coming up in two weeks. Like our water bill's gone up because we're filling up the tub so much. I mean, it's amazing. We've seen life change in over 41 life groups. Our people are connected in these things called relational communities. And we launched our full life growth track um, last spring. Now we have over 130 adults who are actively going through our growth track. Why? Because we want to take you deeper as we grow wider. And we want you to find purpose and actually live out our vision, which is full life. And here's, here's why I say all that. We did all that because people matter to God. Why did we give money? Why did we build a building? Why did we buy land? Why did we start growth groups? Why did we, why did we launch the track? Why, why did we do all this? Because we want to make it impossible for people to not know Jesus. And so I'm excited to share with you today. Um, there are two kind of big key initiatives that we're going to just run after as a church. And I'm going to invite you to run after it with us in 2020. And um, I'm going to share these with you today officially. Many of you have probably heard this a little bit. But one of the big initiatives we're going to go after next school year, 2020, is we're going to be launching LifePoint Preschool. Y'all fired up about that? I can't wait for this right here. LifePoint Preschool. And what's so cool about this is this is a dream come true for us. We always, um, always prayed, Lord, if you ever provide a permanent location uh, we don't want this building sitting empty six days a week. Like, I, I'm not saying other churches are wrong for that. It's just, it's the vision God's given us. I want this place packed, and we want to pour into the next generation. What I love about LifePoint Preschool is that this will be ours, meaning it will look like Discovery Point. It'll have the values, the beliefs. We want to pour into the next generation from the time that they are young to empower them, to have them recognize the life in Christ that Jesus died for them to have. 
And so it's gonna be great, and we're gonna be launching this, and um, you're gonna get to hear more information about that in the next several weeks coming. But today, um, we have a tent outside. It's our Make It Impossible tent. We're gonna have it every weekend, and you can meet our uh, preschool director, Audra. You can get on an email list. Uh, registration for preschool is gonna open up coming up in January. But again, we're excited. We're, we are really excited to run after this right here to impact families um, in our community. Because you may not know this if you don't have small kids, but like every Christian preschool is on a waiting list because like everybody's moving to this area. Um, then the second big initiative that we're gonna be going after is we're gonna be expanding this building uh, coming up this winter. So we're gonna be launching phase two is what we're really praying about. And we're gonna be, Lord willing, knocking out this back wall right here, extending parking uh, to continue to provide space for people who don't know God yet. And I wanna share these details with you about what this second phase expansion is gonna look like. And I wanna do that by welcoming our executive pastor, Gary, to the stage. Would y'all help me welcome Gary Hyde to the stage? Come on out here, my man. Good to see you, brother. Good, good. So Gary doesn't get a lot of stage time. If you don't know Gary, he's been on staff with us um, really for about seven years with me. And uh, it's been a wild journey. And we've had a ton of fun together. And um, hopefully you'll get to hear and get to know Gary. He's got a phenomenal story. Uh, when he gave his life to the Lord in his 30s and just literally radically changed everything, um, was working a great job, construction, background, project manager, uh, percentage owner in the company, developing shopping malls and different things in our area that you shop at. And I'm not saying that to glorify him. I'm showing like he walked away from it all to start being a part of kingdom building in the church. And so what's really cool about this is when we built this building, we have this guy on our team who through the whole process was what is called our owner rep. And so every day he was here making sure things were getting done on time and the schedule and the proof of just his heart and his excellence is we finished, you ready? On time and on budget. Hello, that's a miracle. So let's thank Gary, yeah. We had a great team, that's for sure. And we really, did. Really good team. We had a phenomenal team. And so we're just very gifted um, and blessed. And I really do mean that to have you. And we're excited to go at this again. And I am too. Yeah. So what I want to show you is this is really neat. When we started this journey three years ago, I think you're going to appreciate this, those of you that are planners. Um, we actually, when we got our architect and we got our contractor, we started with the end in mind. What do I mean by that? I mean, they simply showed us, okay, on 12 acres of land, this is about how big of a building you can build with parking infrastructure. So Gary, why don't you show us the original master plan three years ago? Yeah. Yeah, so what you're looking at is the original master plan. He already said some of this, that we started with about 11 or 12 acres in mind because we had already started. We built teams. We talked a little bit about that. We found an architect, a contractor. We did design build type construction. And um, also, we're able to bring those guys back now, the same team, which yeah. really helps us with cost and schedule and all that. And what you're looking at here, I'll let you take it in a minute, is right here is the paved parking in the front. This is the building you're in. And this is the, where you're sitting, right about here. So just to get you, again, an idea of where you're at, this is the paved parking, and this is the gravel right here. So all along, we had thought about if God provides, yep. which he is, to build a phase two, and then eventually, again, if God provides, a phase three, which would be a new auditorium and a new four-year entrance over here. So that's, that, again, that's starting with the, the whole master plan in mind and kind of working through that. Yeah, and the value of the team has been amazing. It allows us to move more efficient, quicker, with the same architect, same contractor, same, I mean, everything. It's been, it's been really great. So when we were now looking at phase two, because, you know, quickly we went from two services to three, and we're like, all right, Lord, what, you know, what do we do? Um, one of the things that you just need to know, um, your leadership here at LifePoint, staff and elders, we are committed to making sure that we are not building poor. Um, we are not going to do that. We're not going to be that church that stands up here every Sunday and you're like, oh my God, I feel like I have to give to the, you know, the building payment every year um, or every month. And so we are very wise in that area through great godly leadership. And so we said, you know what, there's no way we can afford to build the big build out. Um, so we said, okay, how do we... How do we add space that addresses our immediate needs, parking, kid space are the two big ones, and, and yet still make it affordable? And so we're excited. Um, what we feel like is a great solution, it's going to really meet our needs really well and be financially affordable, is going to be to add an additional 11,000 square feet onto this building. So show us a phase two, Gary, and walk us through the 30,000 foot view. All right, the same thing. I'm going to give you a minute just to look at it, but this is existing building again. Front parking, this is the phase, the dark line is phase two, what we're talking about, just to give you a minute to take that all in again. Front paved parking, this is the gravel on the side. Mm -hmm. This is what phase two would look like. We're already underway with construction documents for the site work, the civil engineering plans. We're getting ready to submit those. 
um, right before Thanksgiving, and our plan would be to go ahead and add this parking here all the way to about here on phase two ahead of time. Yeah. Hope to be able to break ground early in 2020 and get that new parking because, as you know, that's a big need of ours right now. Yeah. So as you can see, we're moving out the, out the backside of the building. That's what Nate talked about over there, about 11 or 12,000 square foot right there, phase two. Two new entrances, two main entrances now, which would be great. Now let's show the floor plan. This is a little bit about what the floor plan looks like um, in terms of uh, what, the additional space. All right. And again, this is where you're at. You're sitting in the auditorium right here. This is the paved parking out here. Just give you a second to look at that. It's on the big screen, so you can kind of take it in and get a feel for where you're at, what we're looking at. And I'll just walk you through it real quick. Yeah, share with us um, sort of the areas that we gain really good space in. Yeah, so this darker area down here is what we're calling the phase two, which we showed in the previous slides. So if you come in the front doors here, you'll, you know this is the existing lobby, this is the existing hallway. We're gonna renovate these classrooms here, change them over a little bit so they have more room for that age group. We're taking this long, narrow room, which middle school uses now, and we're gonna turn that into some different classrooms by putting partition walls in there. And if you continue down the hallway, this is outside of the, of, the, of the new construction now, out here. You can see this, again, this dark line. New corridor, you come up, there is middle school, dedicated middle school space, so they have a space to meet yeah. all three services if they need to in great. 2020. A uh, large group is moving into this space here. We're just gonna kind of change it around and move, the, move some of the lighting and AVL around in that. Um, middle school, and then more check-in here for the uh, discovery point. So you'll have existing check-in and new check-in area here. Big lobby, you can see that. If you come down this way, this is the big breakout room for discovery point. So as you can see, a lot of this is for discovery point. Yeah. And the, the idea behind this is we're gonna give discovery point what they need now. So as we continue to go, and if we build a, a third phase, which would be the auditorium, yep. we wouldn't have to touch Discovery Point again. They'd be set for good to go. Yeah. Also, it'd be good for expansion with the preschool, with the preschool. too. Yeah. This space is really gonna come yeah. in handy. Um, so the breakout space, next steps, just duplicating what we have up here, because remember, new entrance, we're gonna have Tri-5 tents out here, Tri-5 here, same thing, Everything. children's check-in outside, outside, next steps area, Duplicate, so we'll have duplicate teams on both doors. Yep. Little conference room to use, use it on Sunday mornings. You can use it through the week. And then this multi-purpose space is what we originally had, and in the, in the, we call it the gathering point. We outgrew that. Yeah, we, started, we had to move things around at Discovery Point to make room. So this is dedicated space for things like the full life growth track or orientation. Discover life also, point. Also, yep. uh, and discover life point after, you know, we, we do that every other month. So also what it does for us, though, is it gives us dedicated space if this worship space, again, for the 1030 service, really is normally pretty full, that we can actually do overflow in there. So that really is gonna come in handy. Yeah. Um, you can see more in the dark lines, more seating in here. We seat about probably max 480 in here at the max we've had. We're gonna add about 150, 160 seats. Um, it doesn't really show it here, but this whole back wall comes out over here. And so we're at, at about 150 or 60 seats, which is yeah. really huge yeah. for, again, for that 1030 service. Yeah. And then just quickly through, there's some storage back here so we can get rid of those beautiful storage units out back sitting on the ground. Yep. And then a green room and some space and it'll be uh, double uh, elevated floor space here for storage space. Yeah, this is good. And I love, um, again, I love that it, it meets our parking need. It meets Discovery Point, that we're oversizing it. Yep. We get an additional 100, 125, 150 seats. Takes us about a 600, 650 seat auditorium. Um, and, and to me, this is a, it's an incredible, incredible option that I'm really excited about that I think is really gonna service LifePoint as we continue to move forward. Um, and here's what's really cool. Um, you guys, right now, get to see for the first time what this is actually gonna look like. Do y'all wanna see it? Does anybody wanna see it? Do you really? We don't have to show it to you. I mean, we can, all right, there we go. So check this out of what the space is gonna look like through this rendering video. This is pretty cool, check it out.
Y'all ready? You excited? Man, I don't know. There's just something about that that just gets me excited. And you know what I, you know, I realized that in order for this to happen, um, this is the beauty of God. And we talked about this in the Magic 8-Ball series, if you were here um, for the series we just came out of, that, that God has chosen to use people to accomplish his purpose. Isn't that interesting? That God could have chosen any way to make things happen in the world, but he says, no, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use you. I'm gonna use me, a flawed, broken wife, so, so he can get the most glory. And so I believe that the Lord is inviting all of us to step in to actually making this possible so we can continue to be a church that makes it impossible for people to not know Jesus. So here's what I'm asking you. I want you to start praying. We're building towards the next four weekends, towards what we're gonna be calling Commitment Sunday, December the 8th, 2019. And what I'm asking is on that day, for every family who attends LifePoint, every individual, to prayerfully consider making a one-year financial commitment towards making it impossible over and above your regular giving. Uh, so, so one year to say, okay, God, what can I sacrifice? What could I delay? God, I wanna, I wanna continue to see that vision become a reality. And here's what I know, because I've already seen it. Man, if we all do something, God will do everything. That there is no gift that's too small and there is no gift that's too large. I saw it when we got into this building that God, you know, families that had the means to give fifty to $100,000 and then there are single moms who literally gave 1000 to 2000 over a two-year period. But that's the beauty of the local church that every gift then becomes elevated. There is no gift that's too big and there is no gift that's too small. And, and this to me is um, the beauty of the local church. And I say this all the time, it's not about equal giving. Please hear me. It's about equal sacrifice. It's about saying, okay, Lord, how have you graced us? How have you positioned us? And I know there are some of you here today, you could be one of those upper giving families, and we're gonna need that in order to hit our goal, which I'll share with you here in a minute to help make this possible. But, but, but there's no pressure. Like, if you know me or if you don't know me, I'll never pressure anybody into giving. I'll never, you know, use fear tactics or guilt as a motivation. Listen, this is between you and the Lord. And, 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 and I know that if you will say, okay, God, for one year, I'm gonna step into this, man, you're gonna get to see God do things in your life, and you're gonna get to have an incredible experience with your family. So here's, here's our goals, though, if you're wondering. Um, we got kind of two goals. Over the course of a year, um, 800,000 and 1.5 million. 800,000 and 1.5 million. This is our God goal right here. This is, man, I know if everybody does something and every family says, all right, I'm gonna be a part of it. I'm not gonna, you know, talk myself out of it. There is no gift too small. There is no gift too big. Uh, God, what do you want me to do? I believe we're gonna hit this goal. And so on December the 8th, here's what it's going to look like. And you don't need to memorize all this. We're going to be sharing it with you in detail. But on December the 8th, you'll bring your commitment card, which we'll give to you later. And you'll bring your kickstart gift towards your one-year commitment. So easy math. Let's say you're going to give $10,000 over and above your regular giving for one year to make it impossible. And you want to give half of it up front. So then on December the 8th, you'd bring $5,000 or give it online, whatever you do, and then you'd have the remaining five to give over the course of 2020. So very simple, we're trying to make it very clear, but we're just simply inviting you to join us on what I believe is gonna be an incredible faith journey where we begin to speak with our actions and we say, all right, Lord, I wanna see you do something great in our city. And you know what I love about this is that when, when you give regularly and you serve and, and you invite people here, like we are literally seeing lives changed. And I want you to see this story of a friend of mine, his name's Dan, and I wanna put a face to what it is that we're doing. Uh, Dan was literally the very first person to be baptized in this building on our grand opening Sunday during the 9 a.m. service. So I want you to hear a little uh, story about the impact that God's doing through you here at LifePoint. Check this out. Hi, I'm Dan, and this is Sarah, and we are the LaFonsies, and this is our story. Um, when, we, uh, when we first started LifePoint, um, our relationship was pretty rocky. Uh, we had recently split up, and uh, I was seeing our, our son, who was a baby, you know, about every weekend or every other weekend or so, um, and I had noticed a difference in, in Sarah, and she had just started LifePoint um, through some friends, of our mutual friends of ours that had invited her. I was definitely, I was in a rough place. I was. I was drinking a lot, I was going out a lot, I was missing you know, her being with me, I was missing my son. Um, and then when, when we would be in contact, she seemed much happier. And so that didn't really make sense, right? Like we're split apart and I'm, I'm seeing the best out of her and, and I'm seeing the worst out of myself. And, and so I knew that there was, there was a big disconnect and, and she had mentioned that you know, just getting back into church and back in her roots was really critical to her and that was, she was starting to find quite a bit of happiness and peace. And so I definitely wanted to be a part of that, especially as we were uh, patching things up again and, and trying to make it work. 
I started attending LifePoint with her. And actually the first week that I attended, this is when Matt uh, McGue was, was lead pastor. Uh, Nate was, was preaching and um, it just kind of stemmed from there. I mean, it was, it was captivating and uh, everybody was, was very genuine and very nice and just kind of warming and accepting and, and it just went from there. I was able to see how um, other men, you know, treated their family and, and lived a more selfless life. And, um, you know, I definitely admired men like that and, and I hadn't had a, a good representation of that with, with my growing up. And so that was something that I admired and wanted, and wanted to pursue myself. And so with them being so accepting with, with kind of my background and who I was, um, yeah, it was, that was, you know, that was very meaningful to me and at a place where I needed it. We have had um, significant uh, relationships. I mean, like best friend type relationships with the people that we've, we've been in life groups with. Um, life Point is huge to us. I mean, it has been s such an impact on our lives that I remember you had a job opportunity in Charleston and we were thinking, okay, well, if we take this, we have to come back to Life Point at least once a month. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a huge part of our lives. It's where we have all of our main relationships from. Our fam His mom is here, brother Matt, all of our families in Michigan. Um, so our family is, is Life Point and um, so it, it's a huge part of our lives. So when we, you know, we went to the, the first digging of the land and, and we raised all this money and it was, it was really, you know, a, an awesome thing to be a part of. Um, I had reached out directly to Nate and I just, it was kind of on my heart that selfishly, if I could be the first one to be baptized, that, that was important to me. Um, and just kind of, it was a, it was that whole fresh start, right? It's a new building, um, you know, having a new purpose to my life and for my family and just kind of being the first one off the ship and, and you know, kind of putting all my chips in the middle and going all in, if, you know, and so to speak. I would say, you know, taking that first step and, and giving it a try is, is important because you, you're going to find some everlasting relationships there uh, and it's just going to lead you down a better path in general. That's, that's why we're doing this. I just wanna make sure that we're not getting this fuzzy. I wanna make sure that we know the main aim. It's the irreducible minimum, that people need Jesus. And I love that we are filled with such a generous church that shares the same heartbeat. And I envision Jesus now in Matthew 28 as he's, of course, communicating this to his, this, to his disciples. I think this is the message to us, though. I think, he's, I think if he was here, he would stand on the edge of the stage and, and say, all right, all authority and all on heaven has been given to me. And I'm gonna empower you with my spirit. So go now, continue on this Jesus mission. Make it impossible for people to not know me. And that's what we're gonna go after. And I wanna invite you to be a part of it. So what I'm really inviting you to be a part of is a prayer journey. Um, I'm not expecting you to know what it is you wanna give or if you're gonna give, but I do wanna invite you to go on a prayer journey with us. Um, we're gonna be doing a 24 hour, you'll see it right here, 24 hours of prayer. Um, leading up to December the 8th, which is our Commitment Sunday. So today, if you wanna be a part of that, there's time slots. I don't know if they're 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but literally, we wanna cover an entire 24 hours in prayer leading up to December the 8th. And so I, uh, on your way out today at our Make It Impossible tent, you can sign up, you can grab one of those slots, and you can begin to pray. Also, um, every Wednesday morning, starting this Wednesday, on Facebook Live, we're gonna be doing live devotionals around prayer and around what prayer is. And so uh, on Wednesday mornings, you can get up. You'll see it right there at 6 a.m. Or of course, you can watch it later if you're not an early riser or whatever that looks like for you. But join us um, if you want to live on Wednesday, starting this Wednesday at 6 a.m. And literally, we're just gonna do devotions all about prayer. What is prayer? How, how do we pray? How, how does God move through prayer? How do we, how do we um, lean in on God through our prayers and through our heart? And that's what we wanna do. We just wanna, over the next four weeks, as you're praying, we wanna help you in this journey and ask you, to help run with us, to make it impossible. So I wanna pray for you today as we get ready to close. Would you just stand to your feet with us and on your way out, um, our usher team is gonna give everybody a brochure that literally outlines everything I just had talked about. So on your way out, they're gonna hand you one of these and thanks for being a part of this. Lord, today, God, we are just so grateful, Lord, to be in this space. 
And God, the truth is we are here today because of the sacrifice of so many other people. And I love, Lord, that you use people to accomplish your purpose. You use people to accomplish your purpose. Why not me? Why not now? Why not us? We're in the fastest growing county in the state, one of the most attractive places to live in the country. I don't think it's by chance or happenstance that we just so happen to wind up here. Maybe we're here for something more than a job, more than school, and more than just living our lives. Maybe we're here for something eternal and bigger. God, give us that focus. God, I pray that we run after this with reckless abandon. And God, we sacrifice today for the future of those tomorrow. We love you, Lord. We're grateful for the grace that you've given us, which, which compels us to then be generous back. We pray all this in your name. Amen.